you will need a red, black, and blue marker. We're going to start off with a generalized view of what the preganglionic and postganglionic interaction is. Just a general neuron interacting with another general neuron, typical cell body, you know, dendrite cell body, axon terminal interaction followed by the next neurons, dendrite cell body, axon, axon terminal. Okay, we label them preganglionic and postganglionic. And we go ahead and draw kind of the outline of a ganglion to remind you that oftentimes these interactions occur inside of a ganglion or, you know, the sympathetic trunk, which is basically an elongated ganglion. All right, as you may recall from semester one, when you have two neurons interacting, they interact at a synapse with a presynaptic cell releasing a neurotransmitter, the postsynaptic cell having receptors to that neurotransmitter. And a larger view of that shows neurotransmitter inside of the axon terminal of the first cell, the presynaptic cell, or in this case, the preganglionic cell, and receptors on the first part of the dendrite, for example, of the postganglionic cell, the postsynaptic cell. Additionally, we have to consider the targets. The targets also are able to receive input. Now we're going to go a little further and we're going to say these targets, of course, are made of tissues and cells. And I'm going to put little nuclei inside of there to indicate that they are cells. Let's take a look at that. We also have a synapse. We also have the release of a neurotransmitter from a presynaptic neuron, for example. Let's show a nice picture of that. Neurotransmitters. Inside of the presynaptic neuron, crosses the synapse, and interacts with the cell. So guess what the cell must have? The cell must have receptors for that particular neurotransmitter. So now we're going to go get into a little bit more detail about exactly how this works at the specific individual synapses that we are dealing with. Here we go. The parasympathetic story we're going to begin beginning with because it's a more simple story. And I'm going to just reiterate the story we've been telling over the last two videos. We start with some structures in the central nervous system, such as the a portion of the cranium, the portion of the brain stem, or the S, S2, S3, S4 cranial ner uh, spinal nerves. And then we have a long preganglionic cell, and we have a short postganglionic cell. They are both cholinergic. They both release acetylcholine at their synaptic clefts, which means acetylcholine is released in order to stimulate the second cell, and acetylcholine is released in order to cause some kind of a change in the target cells. So we're going to take this first synapse, which is a pretty standard synapse, and we're going to enlarge it so that you can take a closer look at this. this is, we're going to repeat this story over and over again until you get it. <laughs> this is a cholinergic cell, therefore it produces acetylcholine. Here we have the, the axon terminal releasing acetylcholine. We have receptors on the postsynaptic cell. And these receptors are called cholinergic receptors because they are sensitive to acetylcholine. We are also going to enlarge this interaction between the postganglionic cell and its target. There is the axon terminal of the cholinergic cell there. Of course, it produces acetylcholine and releases acetylcholine. Now, the target tissue is made of cells, of course. The target tissue we're going to use as an example here so that we get a specific example and we can kind of understand how this works. <clears throat> we'll draw our cells here. What we're going to use are cells of the SA node, the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart. We'll have lots more to say about this down the line, but in a general sense, this, these are really important cells inside of the heart. They determine, for example, the heart rate they determine the contractility or the strength of the contraction of the heart, and therefore they and therefore they're very important. They have cholinergic receptors. 
They respond to acetylcholine, specifically the acetylcholine that is released into the synaptic cleft by these postganglionic cells, which are cholinergic. Pretty simple story. Acetylcholine is released. Acetylcholine interacts with cholinergic receptors. We'll come back to the receptors in a moment. For now, let us turn our attention to the sympathetic side of things, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's three different stories to tell here, three different interactions that are important. Again, the sympathetic nervous system starts out with the central nervous system, in this case, T1 through L2 nerves. We have a short preganglionic neuron which is cholinergic, releases acetylcholine. And there's three different types of stories. So the first neuron is always the same. Uh, it's cholinergic, it's blue. Cell body, axon, axon terminal, releases acetylcholine. The first story we'll tell is the one of the singular situations, one of the unusual situations, where we have a cholinergic cell, which is the postganglionic cell that interacts directly with the sweat gland. The other unusual story is where we have a preganglionic cell, which is cholinergic, which interacts directly with the uh, cells of the adrenal medulla. The third story we're going to tell is the one where we have this cholinergic preganglionic cell, but we have an adrenergic postganglionic cell which is going to release norepinephrine primarily. And this will be targeting most of the targets of the, um, of the uh, sympathetic nervous system. Let's start off with the adrenal medulla. So we have a cholinergic cell, releases acetylcholine, and of course, we have target cells. In this case, these are cells inside of the adrenal medulla. These happen to be called chromaffin cells. Now, the chromaffin cells are special. 90% of the chromaffin cells release epinephrine, also called adrenaline. About 10% of the cells, 10% of the chromaffin cells release norepinephrine, also called noradrenaline. Both of these substances, epinephrine and norepinephrine, have similar effects, as in speeding up heart rate, increasing blood pressure. Um, they are closely related in terms of functionality, and structurally they are very similar as well. Our cholinergic cell releases acetylcholine. It is going to interact with receptors on these chromaffin cells. Are the receptors going to be? Adrenergic receptors, or are they going to be cholinergic receptors? They are, in fact, cholinergic receptors. The receptors are named for the neurotransmitter that they received. In this case, they receive acetylcholine, therefore they are cholinergic receptors. By the way, that 90 and 10 is, I've seen it as 80 and 20. Um, I think the big picture here is that the um, the predominant, uh, the predominant chemical that is released by the adrenal medulla is epinephrine, and there's also some norepinephrine released. All right, let's take a look at our next story. We have a cholinergic neuron interacting with an adrenergic neuron. Yes, our preganglionic cell is, is cholinergic. Our postganglionic cell is adrenergic. These receptors, are they cholinergic or are they adrenergic? They are, in fact, cholinergic because they receive input from acetylcholine. One more story to tell in this case would be the interaction of adrenergic neurons, the postganglionic cells, which release norepinephrine primarily or noradrenaline. will release norepinephrine into the synaptic cleft, cross the synaptic cleft, and interact with receptors on the postsynaptic cell. And guess what we're going to use? In this case, we're going to use cells of the 
SA node, <laughs> cells of the sinoatrial node, the pacemakers of the heart, the ones that determine how quickly the heart beats, the contractility of the heart. Therefore, they're going to receive norepinephrine. And so these are called adrenergic receptors. Isn't that an unusual story? The SA node, these cells have both adrenergic receptors. And if we look back at our other figure, they also have cholinergic receptors. That means that cells of the SA node are sensitive to uh, acetylcholine and to norepinephrine. Acetylcholine tends to slow them down. Norepinephrine tends to speed them up. And epinephrine as well. If it is released into the bloodstream, it can also interact with these receptors. Therefore, the SA node has dual innervation. It has sensitivity to both, and it's able to speed up or slow down depending on what is most appropriate at that moment. Next, we take a look at our sweat glands here. We have our acetylcholine released from our cholinergic postganglionic cells. They interact with receptors on the glandular epithelium, as shown here. And these receptors would be called cholinergic receptors. The last story we're going to tell is probably the most straightforward one. We have a cholinergic neuron, which is preganglionic. We have a cholinergic neuron, which is postganglionic. <clears throat> the preganglionic cell releases acetylcholine, and the postganglionic receives that acetylcholine through cholinergic receptors. Now let's talk about those receptors. We start off with the parasympathetic side because the only type of receptor that we have there is the cholinergic receptor. Although it introduces you to the idea that it can be very, very different depending on the type of receptor it is. So there's two subtypes of cholinergic receptors. The first one is nicotinic. A nicotinic receptor is where the acetylcholine interacts and opens up a sodium channel. You may recall from semester one that when a sodium channel is opened, sodium influxes into the cell. This is always excitatory. It always raises the membrane potential. The next type of cholinergic receptor is a muscarinic receptor. In this case, it's a little more complicated. Acetylcholine does not interact directly with the channel, but instead regulate, regulates a G protein or a second messenger system. Now this could be excitatory or inhibitory depending on what that second messenger system does. A second messenger system is designed to make changes within the cell and it really just depends on what type of changes are created. For example, there's an M1, a muscarinic type 1 receptor. These are found in the salivary glands and these are excitatory. They cause the release of saliva. But there's also M2, muscarinic type 2 receptors. These would be the ones that are found in the SA node, which we've already established. Those particular ones will be inhibitory. They actually slow down the activity of those cells. Sympathetic. We're going to take just a corner of this. It's going to be a little small here, but we'll do our best. <laughs> I do want to mention the fact that, of course, there are plenty of cholinergic receptors here. And just like was stated in the previous section, in the previous section, we stated that cholinergic receptors have both nicotinic or muscarinic. The nicotinic will always be excitatory. Muscarinic could be excitatory or inhibitory, depending on what happens. For example, the muscarinic receptors that are present on the surface of the sweat glands would tend to slow down their activity. Next, we have our adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic receptors, of course, are sensitive to either norepinephrine or epinephrine. 
And there's five subtypes. The alpha-1 subtype of adrenergic receptors are found in arteries. The primary role of the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors is to contract those muscles in the walls of the arteries and cause vasoconstriction. There's a few things that vasoconstriction does, and we'll have more information about this down the line. But one of the things that vasoconstriction does is it enhances vasomotor tone. It's called sympathetic tone. It causes a tightening of the blood vessels sort of all over the body. At any given time, most of the arteries of the body are slightly tight. They're slightly constricted. And this actually causes a slight increase in blood pressure, which kind of, you know, an increase in blood pressure sounds bad <laughs> because we'll talk about this down the line too. But a an increase in blood pressure can be, uh, can be very healthy as long as it's not too high of a an increase in blood pressure. So anyway, alpha-1 arteries, vasoconstriction. Now alpha-2, alpha-2 adrenergic receptors do the opposite thing. They inhibit sympathetic activity in general. Um, one of the specific things that happens is they actually decrease your vasomotor tone, they increase the sympathetic tone, and therefore they decrease blood pressure. So there are, there are classes of drugs that are agonists for the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. A an agonist is something that enhances the activity of a particular receptor. It sort of mimics the binding of a neurotransmitter to that receptor. So this class of drugs will decrease blood pressure in people who may have issues with blood pressure. Probably the best known adrenergic receptor would be the beta-1 receptor. The beta-1 receptors are found on the heart. These are the ones that we've been talking about. <laughs> These are the ones that increase the heart rate. They increase contractility of the muscles of the heart. And there's a class of drugs called beta blockers. The beta blockers specifically inhibit the beta-1 adrenergic receptors. These drugs would be helpful if you didn't want to have a very high heart rate. Any kind of a cardiac patient is probably going to be prescribed beta, one, beta blockers as part of their cocktail of drugs. All right, beta-2 adrenergic receptors. A few different things that happen here. I think that what it's best known for is dilation of the bronchioles, the tubes that lead to the lungs and allow the passage of air down to the lungs. These beta-2 adrenergic receptors would be the targets of classes of drugs for people who, for example, suffer from asthma, where they might have blockages of those bronchioles as part of their disease. Therefore, the treatment of the disease would be an agonist for beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which would help to open up those, those bronchial passages. And just so you know, beta-2 receptors are also found in the liver, in the pancreas, and the uterus, where they will have various reasons for being. Lastly, there is the beta-3 adrenergic receptor. These are found in the gallbladder, where they are lesser known exactly what their function is. They're found in the urinary bladder, and it helps to actually relax the cells in the walls of the urinary bladder so that you are less likely to urinate. They're also found in uh, brown adipose tissue, which is fat tissue found in babies. Um, here they are mostly for lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fats and this helps with thermogenesis or um, thermal regulation.